Good afternoon. If you can please take your seats, we'll get started. So thank you so much for attending this session. My name is Azhar Saeed. I'm from Red Hat. I'm one of the chief architects. And with me is? I'm Peramon Klos, uh, CTO and co-founder at PlanGrid. And we're going to talk about what uh, Perry today? We'll talk about the kind of problems that people are experiencing in NFB. So we'll start uh, explaining a little bit what NFB is, why it's great. But at the same time, we are going to take a little bit of a critical angle on uh, is it really going to happen? Why? Why not? What things do we have to fix? So we'll, we'll have a debate about these things that are going on in the industry. Thank you very much. I'm honored to have actually Perry on the stage with me here. And uh, as he said, we're going to talk about a number of topics around NFV, in particular look at virtualized CPE and virtualized PE and how, does that, uh, how can we create a set of composable services to deliver the end-to-end -end service using, of course, OpenStack, because it's an OpenStack conference, and of course, NFV being the biggest use case, and within NFV, virtual CPE being the biggest use case of all of, all of the three. So let's dive straight into the problem, right? Let's dive straight into what is NFV, why is this helpful, what are, the, what are service providers doing with NFV, and then Perry will come and talk about, uh, you know, what's the problem space we're looking into, and we'll go into the architecture, we'll discuss all of the details. Moving forward, so uh, we all know that uh, network virtualization is a rage these days. Why is it? Because you can now move all of the things that ran on um, dedicated hardware onto commercial hardware. Of course, virtualizing those capabilities allows you to now s grow at a different scale. It provides better capabilities, better functionality, and you can then now optimize each one of those functions. Um, Dedicated hardware has been around for some time. It provided some level of dedicated performance. People sold you all these wonderful different ASICs, but now the forwarding performance of general purpose hardware has also improved considerably. And because of that, you're able to now run those functions that were previously only were possible in dedicated hardware onto this general purpose hardware. Now also, just not, it's not just the standard high volume servers, but the, the because of the ability to run this on general purpose hardware, you're now able to evolve components at different scale at different, with different capabilities. Now, future is containers. Of course, you virtualize it first for virtual machines and then perhaps for containers. That provides you a hyperscale type of an environment. You need to be able to write those virtual network functions into this new environment and be able to take this. So it really provides that benefit in terms of better capabilities, better scale, better performance overall. And you can then optimize this to deliver at a real, at, at cloud scale um, in terms of virtual network functions. But is that sufficient? You have to also look at it from the point of view of what's happening in the industry? Where, where are the different technology providers? Uh, how do you integrate all of those technology providers together? You need, of course, some sort of a standardized reference model and a framework. And that particular standardized reference model allows you to provide some definitions, allows you to understand the different approaches that are available, and stitch them together into a holistic architecture with a set of standard management interfaces, to build this overall scale-out model that we just spoke about. And that particular framework needs to be flexible enough to allow to, to give you a go-to-market model that, that says, how can we take different components, compose them together to deliver an end-to-end -end service? So this idea of decomposing them, evolving them independently, gives birth to a new notion of a marketplace, much like you have an app store for the, for the mobile world, you can potentially have an NFV marketplace, which allows you to actually take different network functions, put them together, onboard them on a common infrastructure, compose a set of services that allow you to deliver that. What's the benefit? Well, carriers want flexibility. We, we have established the fact that they want uh, the ability to create services with very high agility. Then one of the biggest reasons that was cited as, as per different set of surveys that was done was, to, was the reason why we need this set of de decomposition of capabilities and disaggregation of capabilities is the, is the ability to move much, much faster, uh, reduce the uh, go-to-market time, 
reduce the onboarding time, reduce the production time in terms of different sets of services from months down to weeks and days, perhaps. So service creation becomes incredibly valuable. Service creation, if you're able to create services faster, you can monetize them better. And of course, provide operational benefits and cost benefits associated with that. Why? Because you're using a standardized, high volume server architecture to be able to deliver this multi-tenant, flexible sets of services with a very short life cycle. Now comes the question, okay, so what are the most common use cases of NFV, network function virtualization? Well, here are four that have emerged pretty much in terms of the, the highest valued or, or most deployed type of use cases. Virtualized CPE, or sometimes also referred to as Cloud VPN or SD-WAN, people use different names for that particular function, but it's actually quite interesting that depending on the type of service they're trying to deploy or deliver, they can end up actually naming that capability. But it's roughly the same. The idea of actually taking a virtual network function, running it in the cloud, and providing a service, or a set of network functions, running them in the cloud and providing a service to the end customer. Um, in the mobile space, virtualized IP, um, IMS and virtualized EPC are the strongest, and I believe there are a number of presentations here at this conference that talk about uh, both of those subjects. GILAN, that's also available in the mobility space. GILAN, if you don't know, is essentially a set of packet handling capabilities on the SGI interface from a P, um, uh, on the EPC for the P gateway. Now, the idea of doing those, that packet handling is to do things like video optimization, to do things like you know, um, TCP optimization, web handling of traffic, deep packet inspection, and so on and so forth. So that's the virtualized GI LAN function that's actually pretty popular from a mobile provider perspective. And last but not least, it's this, it's, this is an emerging use case, which is virtualized PE, or the provider edge environment. Now, People have said, well, why should I limit myself to taking this virtual network functions and applying them only for customer premise services? Because now we are able to get that level of performance from hardware, get that level of forwarding capability and functionality that's virtualized. You can potentially now create provider edge devices as well by stitching functions together to be able to deliver service at a, at a highly dynamic scale. Let's quickly take a look at the virtual CPE reference design. Now, in a physical CPE, you have a rigid device that has some sort of rigid scaling characteristics and rigid performance characteristics. When you disaggregate those capabilities, so what, are, what does a CPE have today? It has a virtual router, it has some packet inspection, it has some you know, um, DHCP, DNS type of services. They're all bundled together in a single software image that runs on a dedicated piece of hardware. That's now package dependent from the vendor. That's now you know, functional dep dependent from the vendor in terms of what they need to provide. And it doesn't scale the way that you wanted it to scale. So take that, go to the virtualized model. You can disaggregate these set of capabilities. You can actually scale them independently. You can provide Moore's, I mean, use Moore's law in terms of economies of scale to actually move in a different direction. It's much lower overhead because then you can put these functions in a centralized cloud-like environment and ensure that you can actually manage them centrally, so thereby providing faster um, set of services. Now, one other data point that I'll talk to you about before I hand it off to Perry for, for you know, some more questions and some more details is let's take a quick look at a reference design. Now, again, People use different names, but typically, broadly, if you take a virtual CPE, you can classify them into two buckets, something called a thin CPE model, something called a thick CPE model. In a thin CPE model, what you have is essentially a device, call it a NID, call it an interface, whatever it is, network interface, that essentially encapsulates all of the traffic from the customer side and shunts it over to the data center, where in data center, you now create that composable services model. In a thick CPE device, you actually have some processing compute capabilities sitting out at the edge, at, at that customer side. Typically, people use these two models to, do, to provide services for either enterprise or residential. 
That's kind of a typical breakdown. It's not necessary that that be the case. You can find a thin CP model in the SMB case and a thick CP model in the residential case as well if somebody's willing to pay that kind of money. But the point is made, which is you have an interesting deployment, two different deployment models here, where you there is a, um, what I'd like to say is there's actually, um, in the way you compose those set of services using these two models, it actually creates some interesting ramifications with respect to how do you place VNFs, how do you worry about the design and so on. But we'll look at that a little bit later. But if you just take this broad reference model and say, okay, life's good, why? VCP can be deployed, I can virtualize those network functions, and you see so many different uh, references here in terms of people either announcing VCP service or trialing VCP service and saying, yeah, this is available, please go ahead and use it. So then, what is the problem? <coughs> so, Azar made a nice description explaining what were the motivations for this transformation, what's the value, what's the value from a service provider point of view, and how they are going to transform their business or offer more service and minimize their cost and operational efficiencies, and how from a technology point of view, the vendors that are going to create network functions will enjoy a marketplace and so on. So uh, everything looks good. And based on the discussions that are going on in the industry, uh, deployments are happening, lots of references, everybody's betting on that. We've been working with Red Hat uh, with some customers creating nice NFB solutions for uh, call centers, for BCPs, and so on. But then we started working together and we started to say, okay, so, so there has to be a problem because somehow what we are seeing is that uh, adoption is happening, but not at the pace where everybody would like to see it and how big is the market. So we started to, to try to understand what was going on. So we said, Let, let's size a little bit the problem on this new transformation on from buying hardware appliances to transforming into this now of wall and see what are the fundamental problems that we need to focus as an industry uh, in order to make the adoption faster and more successful. So the first thing is about, okay, uh, we are going to migrate from dedicated boxes to VMs or to some sort of compute structure. Let's, let's size it. Let's see what uh, big the market would be and how many servers and instances we would have. And the reference design that Azar was presenting was based on a, uh, what would be a very simple VCP deployment where you have, let's say, one or two virtual machines per VCP. A lot of times one is to provide the routing and security capabilities, the other is to provide the VPN capabilities, and uh, they essentially map to an existing VCP. So we said, okay, let's, let's size it. Let's see, let's check just a few major countries, in this case it's China, India, Europe, and United States. And let's see how many houses do we have, how many households do we have in those countries. And note that this is not the whole wall, it's just a portion of the wall. I said, what if you would have 10% adoption of BCP solutions, 30% adoption, 50% adoption? What if you would use two VMs per CPU? And then you say, well, what if I could pack 100 VMs per server? Which, I mean, this is a relatively dense environment. And it boils down to a relatively large number of servers, two million for a 10% adoption, and up to 10 million servers for a 50% adoption. Those are a lot of servers, and those servers are expensive. So we'll, we'll touch upon about that. Then the other dimension is, okay, so this is an NFB cloud. Packets need to come in and out. So what's the bandwidth? What's the packets per second? What's the network traffic that those servers have to handle? Because if I move from a dedicated appliance with, let's say, uh, 20, 40, 100 gigabit links to a server that handles the bandwidth, uh, how much do I have to pump into each server in order to create a proper solution? And same numbers, and now we say, well, what if we would like to have 10 megabit CPs, which nowadays is a fairly standard or low-end connectivity? What if I would like to have 100 megabits per second CPs? What if I would like to have one gigabit per second uh, CP? And then uh, project different options, 10, 30, and 50 percent. And it boils down that uh, a server would have to handle between 500 megabits per second and 50 gigabits per second. On the lower side of the scale, we are there. I mean, handling uh, 500 megabits per second and even 5 gigabits per second is not a big deal. On the 50 gigabits per second, then uh, some technologies get you there, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that. But it becomes kind of uh, the second component that needs to be considered. So if you look like that, you say, well, based on the number of servers, uh, we said that uh, for a 30, 50% adoption, you would have up to like two to 10 million servers. 
uh, we are saying that probably this industry is bigger than all the cloud service providers combined. Which, if you think, if you translate to a $5,000 per server, it would require at least a $50 billion investment on servers to make NFB happen. And uh, if you think it like that, you are saying, well, uh, is this going to happen? I mean, well, we have to figure out something else. In the sense that uh, if we just take it as a transformation from physical to virtual, if we just take the kind of obvious aspect that we would say, we'd like to instantiate VMs on demand, we'd like to have easy operations, we'd like to have API and automation and so on, all these are great things. But there is much more when you go from an industry that has been working in a specific way for 20 years into a new way. It's not just projecting exactly the same way of thinking, the same way of uh, managing and understanding the concepts that you have in the old way into the new world. You have to start thinking, yes, it's a good model, it's a good reference because I can project my business and I can carry my customers with it because the customers understand the services that I was projecting in the old world. But as I move them into the new world, is not only to move them into the new world, it's to make them understand that there's different ways of making things that may make the industry more viable. So we'll discuss a bit more about that. And then we were discussing with us, that, well, uh, that's it. I mean, this is more or less the sizing. But then we started working with service providers, and service providers, they want a little bit more, right? Because uh -huh. when they create a deployment, it's not just to provide you a routing and a VPN capabilities, because otherwise they wouldn't monetize it. They ask usually for a little bit more. So what do they ask for? So, you know, that, that, that's so true. You know, when, when you give flexibility to service providers, they are, they'll look at it and say, hey, why do I have to just live with, you know, these two packages that you have? Why can't I just now separate everything out? So, and create this composable service model that you talked to me about. Now let's take an enterprise branch. In an enterprise branch, what are the different types of things that go on? Purely from a network, I'm, I'm not even going to talk about the different applications that run. Purely from a network and network connectivity perspective, you have WLC, wireless LAN controllers. You have some network functions such as DHCP, DNS, firewall, right? You have some directory capabilities that are sitting there. You have some IPPBX systems for voice over IP things, and then of course you have the routing function. Now purely from a network standpoint, these are the things that run. That's how many VMs we are already talking about. So the earlier assumption that Perry made was two VMs per site or per branch, or per, right, or per customer. There you have it. You just blew it apart by having four or five different. Now when you actually run these on different pieces of hardware today, you now need to collapse them down to you know, general purpose hardware with multiple VMs on that hardware that provide you all these type of capabilities. And then there's this, this concept of converge branch that's going on quite a bit. Talk to, you know, if you're an enterprise, you understand exactly what I mean. And if you're a service provider, you know what the opportunity is sitting in front of you. So you need those set of virtualized capabilities now to run on these general purpose servers. And so you take away down the assumption of those two VMs per, serve, per customer now to what five, six, seven that may be put together or stitched together on a per brand side. Now, how do you actually take those set of VMs and stitch them together? What is this capability? Well, you can do some sort of static mapping and you can say, hey, I'm gonna, I have a data flow that I need to use and I'm gonna create what is called a service function chaining to follow that particular data flow. So that means a packet needs to be, you know, marked with some QoS here, some traffic shaped here, and then, you know, run through a firewall and then, then de delivered here. That's kind of a topology type mapping where you have a data path, you have a fixed data path, and based on some capabilities, you're gonna insert a new node into that data path, and so you do a service insertion associated with that particular data path. You could also do a policy context in there. Why, for example, you'd notice something that's going on weird in your network and you suddenly want on the fly changes to that particular data path to say, hey, because I saw something that was going on in my network, I'm now going to do some more deep packet analysis, some, a better understanding of what's going on so that I can take action on it, whether it's a security threat or whether it is some, some other capability in terms of you know, subscribers complaining that this is not happening. 
Well, if you add those capabilities, whether you do this at a branch level or whether you do this, do this inside a data center for all those customers combined, you can actually do a policy-based type of an insertion architecture in terms of service function chaining there. What does it do to the model? So if you actually take a look at all of those different kind of services, here's a laundry list that comes up. Virtualized firewall, application load balancers, intrusion protection capability, SD-WAN, virtual routing, email subscriber services, DNS, DHCP, NAT, blah, 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 and blah. Each of these, some of them may be bundled. Some of them may be running independently. Now, you have to now have the infrastructure that's capable of providing these type of services that can be stitched together into a service function chain to be able to deliver that virtualized CPE capabilities or that service that you need for, from an end user perspective. So based on all of these, what does the architecture look like? Let's take a quick look at that particular architecture. Well, we can redraw the picture and we could say, hey, it was very, very simple. We had that particular one server sitting out on the site and then we had this, you know, uh, some capability in the cloud that says, oh, I have some VMs associated with a, with a subscriber, and I'm going to put those VMs there and pass my traffic through them. Well, now you need classifiers, you need packet handlers, you need the ability to actually stitch those packets going from left to right um, across and route those packets based on the different kinds of capabilities. And if you take the residential services example, you need quota management, you need firewall, you need parental control, and so on. So all of these capabilities then need to be stitched together in terms of that composable service model, whether you're doing it for virtual CPE or whether you're doing it for you know, virtualized PE. What do they mean from an open stack infrastructure perspective? More VMs, more you know, functionality, higher scale, higher bandwidth. So then, Perry, how do you go resize this? Mm -hmm. Yes, so if you see this reference design, we could count easily 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 BMs. So let's be conservative. Let's do the same exercise as before. Let's try to assume, let's say, six virtual machines per service. And let's do the same as before. Let's look at certain countries, the households, and let's look 10% penetration, 30 and 50. And you start seeing that the number of servers needed, if you could pack 100 BMs per server, starts to be like uh, 6 million for a 10% penetration and 31 million for a 50% penetration. So it's kind of difficult to start thinking that those numbers will make sense from an industry point of view. So if these numbers were true, I mean, you think, what's the size of the pie? What's the size of the industry? How much money people will spend on these environments? And it's like, it's going to be $150 billion investment. So it's not going to happen. I mean, the whole premise about uh, migrating from existing hardware-based appliance into a, an x86 wall, into a, a virtualized wall. It was about uh, operational efficiencies, but there were some capital expenses that they have to be minimized. So the idea is that uh, the current approach where we are going in terms of how to transition the industry from uh, traditional appliances to an NFB market has to be rethought a little bit. So we were saying, okay, let's, let's look at uh, what ideas do we have to uh, provide in order to make that happen. And this is the areas that you say, it's not only how to go into a whiteboard and design an architecture on how we are going to solve the problems from an automation for service delivery, for service creation, to create a marketplace, to create a way that uh, we are going to monetize the service providers and so on, but rather has to be, let's design it in a way that the business aspect, the cost, the sizing of the system go together. And as you see, we discussed that there are three main pillars. Uh, when we start exploring solutions to say, okay, when we go beyond the current state of NFB that uh, it's, let's say, some early deployments, some successful early projects, but what's going to happen when the industry migrates to 5G, let's say, when the next big span of infrastructure is going to happen and where people are going to start saying, okay, now I'm going to have tons of bandwidth coming from different devices uh, and something that is going to drive this transformation in a more aggressive way. So we have to look at it in these three pillars. Basically, first is the bandwidth. We are still talking networking, uh, regardless if you add security or intrusion prevention or email scanning and things like that. We're still moving data. This is about data in flight. The second is from an architecture point of view. We have to figure out, is moving everything into the public cloud the way to go? Uh, 
uh, into the public cloud or in the NFB cloud, or is uh, keeping everything into the edge uh, the way to go, or is a hybrid model, and we'll discuss a bit more. And the third uh, that we touched upon before was density. It's like, how do we make this happen in an effective way? Do we stay with VMs? Do we go to containers? Do we do something else? So I'm going to go a little bit on one by one and, uh, and give a, a high-level discussion about the topic, and I'm very curious about the opinion of the audience, and after the presentation, please uh, welcome to contact me and, and discuss. I would like to understand your opinions. But essentially, let's start with the bandwidth. The bandwidth, you have uh, two kind of threads. The first one is, do I want the thing to just work? Because basically, I take uh, the Linux kernel and all the capabilities that go into the Linux kernel with or without uh, SDN vendors and NFB vendors that use it? Or do I take a specialized frameworks? And what's the complexity in terms of operations, in terms of upgrades, in terms of managing uh, those two components? Uh, and I have to manage this tension. In there, you see a lot of very interesting initiatives like uh, FIDO, FDIO, uh, that essentially touch a lot of capabilities and features at the high performance based on the PDK. But again, it's kind of a networking bubble, a little bit uh, alien to the Linux kernel. Then you have initiatives like uh, XDP, BPF, IOVisor that are uh, emerging as a way to evolve the Linux kernel uh, in terms of programmability flexibility, and not only from a networking point of view, but even going beyond networking, and at the same time promising the performance that uh, the PDK-like frameworks offer. That's another approach. Uh, it will take some time to mature, but it's an interesting aspect that aligns more with the kind of Linux community. Then, of course, there is the current probably most uh, adopted aspect in terms of uh, NFB solutions today would be kind of the OBS that was born in the Linux kernel or was born as an entity that runs in the Linux kernel, but uh, kind of uh, cross towards the PDK aspect for NFB. And then you have other solutions, like a lot of effort on SmartNix. There's a lot of vendors that they created solutions that run in hardware for valid reasons, for performance reasons, for crypto reasons, for compression, for certain accelerations that may require things beyond just x86 cycles. Uh, or because you want to have isolation, you want to contain the network capabilities within a domain, the smart link that has some programming aspects, and separate it from the workloads, because maybe this is a secure thing that the workloads have to be separated from the networking policies. And of course, uh, the tying to SRIOB. So all this, uh, when you're a service provider that you have to pick a solution, there's trade-offs. And there's trade-offs in terms of capabilities, performance, programmability, network only versus going beyond networking, and availability today versus availability one year from now, one year and a half from now. But this is something that you have to consider when you want to create a solution for cloud that scales. The second is about architecture. As we said, there was thin CP, thick CP, but now if I have a CP solution that all the traffic goes to the cloud, to the NFB cloud, now uh, am I consuming bandwidth just to go in and out? What about if I have an office that has multiple locations, and I don't want to go to the public cloud, to the NFB cloud in order to come back because I want to have my printer traffic go point to point or my voice traffic or my video traffic. So should I explore some hybrid model, what we call a tether CP, which is a CP that you can push some capabilities into the CP? Should we consider like things like uh, AT&T's UCP, universal CP, that I can push VMs into the CP in a way that I don't have to have all the footprint of the VMs into the NFB cloud? Or should I consider different things, like uh, what is networking in the future? Do I need to understand I need uh, VPN services, I need uh, routing services, I need something else? Or do I provide a policy that my office A can talk to my office B and traffic is going to be screened based on something else? Should I, I change the paradigm of networking from a definition point of view? And about density, uh, now there is a lot of uh, uh, hype towards containers. Basically, the obvious one that has to happen is happening. We are all putting a lot of effort on making it happen. Is this notion of saying, okay, I could use VMs, but I could use containers. And just the memory footprint going from VMs to containers would be a huge improvement from a density point of view. But is it enough? As you saw, let's say, the, the, the numbers that we were showing, 30 million servers. Even if you cut them by 10 or by 50, there are still a lot of servers. So should we start envisioning something else? Like uh, there's a lot of going on in the, in the cloud wall with what now is called serverless computing, which is nothing else than essentially having functions that they don't have execution threads. They are just ready to run when an event that affects them uh, triggers them. Well, networking is similar. I get packets, I get connections, and I have to perform something. 
Do I have to have VMs and containers always running and consuming memory and execution threads? Or should I have a set of functions that belong to certain tenants that they are going to execute when a packet comes? So a lot of innovation, a lot of discussion is going to emerge on these things. But just as a finish, I think SR will, will get a little bit deeper. But what, what we've been doing is essentially integrating uh, Red Hat solutions and Plum Ridge solutions in order to deliver the best of breed that we can do today. And this is an industry that is moving very fast. And we should always remember that it's not about what will come two years from now, three years from now, five years from now. It's about how do we transform the business one step at a time? How do we move the operational aspects and we prepare for the future while we keep working very hard on the problems that we expose today? So maybe you want to talk a little bit more about the solution that we have together? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so I think Perry, Perry laid out really, you know, the three different aspects, which is extremely important. Now, how do you take that and actually build a framework around the whole thing to, to deliver a complete solution? So we work very closely with PlumGrid to come up with, hey, there are aspects to managing the networks, tenants, you know, um, overlay, underlay, and so on. And then there's an aspect to actually creating that particular infrastructure that's highly scalable, highly flexible. So if you take, for example, Red Hat OpenStack platform that allows you to actually build that particular infrastructure, automate that using something like Ansible, manage that whole life cycle using something like CloudForm, so manage IQ, and all of these are, by the way, 100% open source projects. And then work with the enhancements that PlumGrid has done in the, in the context of creating that, uh, you know, the connections, managing the fabric, managing the overlay, creating that service chain. Because remember, when we talk about these different kinds of VMs that each provide a service, you need the ability to stitch them together based on policy. Um, I think he raised a very interesting point here in terms of when you move to containers, the paradigm, the networking paradigm is going to shift a little bit. Why? Because now you have a lot higher density than 100 VMs per server. Now you need the ability to actually manage so many more connections and route packets through so many more different uh, you know, paths that come through. So you need that capability, that you need that forwarding capability, you need that you know, functionality that can be integrated together to build a solution. So we've worked actually quite a bit in terms of optimizing and working through Red Hat provides 100% open source software and supports it, and PlumGrid now also has you know, open source capabilities that they have actually worked with us to actually enhance and integrate and take that solution and build it further. So wrapping this whole thing up, NFV market is real. Um, 5G from a mobile perspective is, the is one of the m potential drivers. We didn't even discuss that over here, by the way. We only talked about virtual CPE, and we only talked about virtual PE briefly and so on. If you apply the same capabilities to the mobile environment, now you have virtual EPC, the Evolve Packet Core, and now imagine a whole set of mobile routers sitting out there or mobile devices that are sitting out there. Context of IoT, context of 5G deployment services. That's just going to complicate the matter even further. And you need all of those design criteria and capabilities that Perry spoke about. There are still a bunch of unresolved problems. We need to look at them. We need to understand what that particular architecture is and get involved from a community perspective in terms of development, provide features. If you attended the keynote, you actually had, um, you know, there was an interesting point of collaboration that was brought out, something called VLANaware VMs. That's a feature that's coming in Newton. By the way, how many of you knew that VLANaware VMs or private VLAN capability has something, is something that has existed for about 15 years, and we didn't have that feature. It's only coming out in Newton. How did that happen? Well, people understood, well, if you were gonna use the OpenStack infrastructure to deliver these kind of services, you need these type of capabilities. So more people, the more people are involved, the more they're looking at these different deployment models, the better it becomes and matures uh, over time. There is no universal solution. There is no single solution that fits all. There's no one yardstick that can measure everything in terms of each one of the requirements are different. Each one of the capabilities that people need are different. So you need to be able to pick and choose what you need to deploy, how you need to deploy, build that service, and deliver it to your customers. Uh, VNF vendors are providing some interesting solutions. There are still some uh, challenges associated with them. 
multi-tenancy may be one of those issues. Scale, hyper bandwidth is, mm -hmm. is, is another issue. And we are working together to provide some solutions and onboard those different VNF types so that we can actually provide a functionality and capability across this. And the last I would say is, try it, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like uh, deploying an environment to understand how it can help your business and what challenges are important to you and how to start working on addressing them. Questions? Wow. Either the topic was clear or it was clear as mud. That was a joke. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.